It's 15.02 and we have uh, many issues to discuss and many esteemed guests to offer their points of view. I'm very honored to be here today at this important meeting. Our region, the Arab states, is undergoing painful transitions and enduring harsh conflicts. Women and men are suffering and have been suffering for years. One country that is truly making an effort to alleviate some of this suffering is Jordan. The country which for years have provided refuge to Palestinians is now also hosting a score of Syrian refugees, 600,000 to be exact, out of which 50% are women and children. Approximately 85% of all refugees are hosted within Jordanian communities and the remaining 15% are accommodated within camp settings. Jordan has taken pioneering steps in advancing the Beijing platform for action in the area of concern, women and armed conflict by championing in spreading the culture of peace at the regional level working on the establishment of a national action plan on Security Council Resolution 1325 and taking major steps in promoting women's representation in diplomatic and peacekeeping missions. Given Jordan's pioneering in this area, it is only natural that they have convened us today for what I am sure will be an interesting debate on women in armed conflicts. We often tend to view women and children as victims, but women are agents of change and have, and have a transformative role to play in mediation, peace building, and conflict resolution. And I'm very interested in hearing more about the experiences from the distinguished panelists. I would like now to introduce Her Excellency, Ms. Dina Kawar, the ambassador and permanent representative of the permanent mission of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan to the United Nations to provide us with some welcoming remarks and also for Her Excellency to introduce Her Royal Highness Princess Basma bin Talal who has a special message to us. Madam Ambassador. Thank you very much and I'm so honored to do the opening remarks. Um, today and I would like first of all to thank you and women for this uh, initiative and uh, to make this uh, event take place in this reality. I would also like to thank Salma who has been doing a wonderful job and the delegation, the Jordanian delegation with whom I had the pleasure to have lunch and discuss uh, things in more depth. Um, Princess Basma who you will be hearing um, soon after uh, she is one of the pioneers um, in Jordan who's, who has taken up the role of uh, women long, long, long years ago and she has uh, done such incredible job. Um, you need only to research to find out about the incredible job she has been doing in, in promoting women through uh, the creation of networks and working on the laws in Jordan to try to advance the, uh, the um, role of women. And actually, she is the reference for all of us when it comes to this issue. I would also like to say that Jordan has, is one of the countries that has had, uh, had, that has been pivotal in all that is happening in the Middle East, because we started off with the Palestinian issue and the refugee and the women issues in, in conflict. Then we had the Iraqi uh, refugees that came into Jordan. At one time, it was up to 750,000. And now with the Syrians, we have almost 600 or 650,000 plus the uh, Syrian population that was in Jordan uh, before. So we are well placed in the Middle East to, to be able to talk about our experiences, which I assume you will be doing. And um, just to say that uh, women are the first victims in any war, uh, not because men suffer less, but because they end up having to carry the burden of the family and uh, uh, whether they are IDPs or refugees or much of the time if they're alone because their husbands are not there. So as a member of the UN Security Council, um, Jordan has, uh, is very active in, in promoting the 
role of women and the sufferances that women have had in, in, the, in wars all over. We should not forget what has happened recently with the Yazidi women and others in Iraq and with the barbaric brutalness of uh, Daesh towards these women. And that's something for us to remember that it should not happen again. Um, the same goes for the, the women, the Syrian women who are having all these uh, uh, difficulties. I will not say any more, uh, and I didn't even read this. I, they, always, they always write me and I never read. And I, I feel guilty about my stuff more than about myself. So uh, just to say welcome and I leave the, you know, the, th the more interesting things for others to say. And I'm, thank you very much. I'm honored to have done. Thank you, Your Excellency. And, and now the video message from Her Royal Highness. كان إعلان بكين عام 1995 معلما رئيسا في تعزيز المساواة بين الرجال والنساء ولحظة فارقة في حياة الحركة النسائية العالمية ساهم بتمكين الملايين من النساء والفتيات وفتح أفاق المستقبل لهن ومنذ تلك الفترة قطعنا شوطا طويلا ولكن هذا يقودنا إلى التساؤل أما إذا كنا قد هيئنا الأجواء لجيل الشباب الذي ورث إنجازات بكين ليكون على دراية كاملة بالآمال والطاقات التي تم بناؤها آنذاك والأهمية التي يحملها إعلان بكين لهم لأن الشباب في نهاية الأمر هم المعنيون بالحفاظ على روح إعلان بكين ودفع مكتسباته إلى الأمام وعلى الرغم من الاضطرابات المتعددة التي أثرت على معظم مناطق العالم منذ ذلك الحين سواء الحروب أو الأزمة المالية العالمية وتبعاتها أو الربيع العربي لمسنا الجهود الكبيرة التي بدلت من أجل تمكين النساء والفتيات في مجالات عديدة بالمقابل علينا أن نستشرف ما يمكن أن يحمله لنا هذا القرن الجديد وكيف يمكننا الاستمرار بتنفيذ إعلان ومنهاج عمل بكين بالرغم من مثل هذه الأوضاع وتداعياتها لقد تم إجراء تقييم لإعلان ومنهاج عمل بكين من قبل ولكن مع تزامن التقييم في هذه المرحلة مع تقييم الأهداف الإنمائية للألفية والتي ستصب في جدول أعمال التنمية لما بعد 2015 آمن أن نتمكن من إرساء أرضية مشتركة بينهما وأن نتفوق على أنفسنا من خلال اتخاذ توجه علمي وواقعي لهذا الموضوع ففي نهاية الأمر علينا أن نبني هذا التقييم بكل جدارة على ما سبق وجعل نتائجه أقرب ما يمكن للتطبيق فبإرادة أخوات العربيات ومشاركة المرأة في كل أنحاء العالم وجميع المهتمين بقضايا حقوق المرأة أرجو أن نتمكن من إعادة الزخم والألق الذي شاهدناه في بيكين Many thanks. Uh, some of the main messages, we need to pave the way for the role of youth in implementing the Beijing platform of action. We must examine where we stand today and we have to find the common ground between the SDGs and the platform for action. Needless to say, it is excellent to see the strong political will and commitment from the government in this area. We will now proceed with the panel discussion aiming at having this as interactive as possible. I will ask each of the speakers one question and to request that their initial intervention is no more than seven minutes before proceeding into a discussion which I welcome by both the panelists and you, the audience. First is Dr. Salma Nims the Secretary General of the Jordanian National Commission for Women. Dr. Salma is a very rich, has a very rich background working on women 
and development on all sides of the spectrum, government, civil society, the United Nations. Dr. Salma, may I ask you to provide a brief overview of Jordan's major engagements at the national and international level to protect women in armed conflict, and if possible, link it to your uh, work done specifically under the 13 25 Thank you, and uh, please allow me again to thank you and women for the support that we are receiving uh, uh, in our work to achieve gender equality in Jordan, and specifically now with this uh, side event and with the focus on women and armed conflict in Jordan. <laughs> to be honest, this session comes at a time when the regional events are threatening the lives and rights of women in the areas of conflict in the Middle East, subjecting them to the worst forms of gender-based violence and exploitation. You know, in Jordan, this is a major concern for us, even if it's an, not affecting women, Jordanian women themselves, but we see it happening around the region. But the protection of women in times of conflict and post-conflict is now more just, just than just a commitment for a, to a UN resolution in our region, but rather a matter of urgency, obligation, and accountability for the international community as, a, as at large. Countries that are hosting growing number of refugees, such as Jordan, face many challenges to respond to the increasing uh, population numbers, to providing the services and securities that are needed, and to maintain at the same time the social, economic, and uh, political achievements that have been achieved since the adoption of the platform. And this is the problem, because we want to keep going on. We want to maintain this, this, uh, this momentum of achievements, but at the same time, we are brought down with all these uh, concerns. They are not only economic burdens, they are not only security burdens. We are being attacked by a system of thought that is threatening what has been achieved for women in the Arab region. It has been, and I want to refer here to the regional, uh, to the regional effort that was taken by the UN and specifically ESQA uh, in reviewing the uh, regional uh, achievements for the Beijing plus 20. And uh, we met, we did a, an amazing, it was an amazing effort that was done uh, in order to get all the Arab countries to provide their reports and then to come up with a regional assessment. But we went to a Cairo last uh, February and the only theme that was haunting all of us was what's happening to the women in our region. I think this was like the main concern. It is not only a security or an armed concern, but military concern, it is a um, cultural concern that we think that we need to start tackling at the media level, at the educational level, at the cultural production level. It is not just an issue of security and military. Now, for us in Jordan, um, um, the Jordanian National Committee in 2010, before the start of the Arab Spring, Spring, we started leading a process of establishing a coalition of the civil society, relevant UN agencies, government agencies, and uh, all security relevant source, uh, forces in order to have a coalition regarding the implementation of Resolution 1325. And we worked on developing um, a draft action plan for the implementation of 1325. And the, the plan is going through because of the number, the huge number of people involved, it takes a lot of time to build consensus in order to establish what, how we're going to go forward. It's on the table of the government now in order to be endorsed. What we want and why we need it, I think Jordan has done a lot and I will talk about it towards the implementation of 1325. You don't need a plan to do that because it is part, because we've already, um, we've already uh, adopted Beijing platform, we already uh, adopted SIDAO with uh, two reservations. So Jordan is, uh, is committed to uh, achieving gender equality and to ensuring women's participation in, uh, in decision making regardless of 1325. But we need 1325 now more than ever because we need to be able to monitor and to actually say how far are we going and who's doing what. It's very important to do it now. So um, now the, uh, the plan is, on, uh, is based on three main pillars. One, it's related to the enhancement and protection of girls' and women's rights in and in front of the law. Second, mainstreaming gender in policies, strategies, programs, and plans, and their implementation process. And third, raising social awareness and building capacities and partnerships between the government and the civil society towards the implementation of the resolution. 
So it is not only related to, we, we have the framework for, and this is very important, in Jordan, the framework, legal framework and services that are provided in terms of protection of women from violence are all provided regardless of nationality. Whoever, you know, the, the law is implemented on everyone and the service are provided to everyone, whether it is governmental services that we have, but actually, and we have the civil society on the table with us, we pride, we are very proud in Jordan with the amount of effort that the civil society, in addition to the UN uh, efforts that are being given to refugee women and to host communities, it is very important that there is now an effort that not only we are protecting the women inside uh, refugee camps, but we, there is a recognition that the host communities and women in host communities are also bearing the effect of the violence and of the, inf two minutes left, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think uh, this is a very important notion that, that we need to talk about. I just want to bring attention to the fact that despite all the efforts that we do. There are many re very important relevant issues that are affecting refugee women now in the region, especially in the issue of forced child marriage, I think is a very important issue that we really need to look about. I know that there are arguments, even in Jordan, even within between Jordanians, it is still relatively high. It did not come down, it's 13.2%. For refugees, it's around 28%. Some people argue that this is part of the Syrian culture, and I beg to differ, because you have to think, in what context was the girl getting married when she was in her rural area? Who was she marrying, and what was the negotiation powers that she had, so, or her family had? So it, it might be her cousin, it might be someone who's only seven or eight years older than her. But now the situation is that they are in a, in a, in a, in a, in a weaker position and then it is a different form of, of, of marriage under different power, uh, different power relations and it means that they are being exploited and we are doing a lot of efforts under the gender-based violence, so this, I'm ending with this, uh, the gender-based violence task group that is working with the UN, we are working on the task with the task force on uh, child forced uh, uh, child manage, and they are working with the religious ministries in order to be able to start facing this major problem in addition to the other issues, which probably we will bring up while we are discussing around the, dis around the table. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect timing. Uh, it's not a security uh, issue only, and, and we need a comprehensive approach to work on it. The commitment from Jordan came way along before uh, putting the 1325 plan. There are 13 pillars for the plan, and there are many issues affecting women uh, in that realm. One of the main issues is the child uh, brides or the child marriages. Next is uh, Ms. Ala Murabit, uh, medical doctor, uh, founder and president of the Voice of Libyan Women, uh, UN Women Advisor and UN Security Council Resolution 1325 Advisor, Women, Peace and Security Expert. Ala has broad experience on women, peace and security from the region and is the founder of the Voice of Libyan Women, a prominent women's rights organization based in Libya. Ella, I would like to ask you a question that is at the forefront of the regional debate right now and that was also tabled at the recent uh, Beijing Plus 20 review meeting held in Cairo, namely the concrete threat of fundamentalism, terrorism, and the increasing involvement of non-state actors in armed conflict. How do we address these challenges from a rights and equality perspective? Ella, seven minutes. That will be extremely easy <laughs> to answer this question in seven minutes. First, thank you very much for having me, and thank you to UN Women for organizing this along with the Jordanian mission. I get to be in Jordan in two weeks for our 1325 global study consultation, so I'm extremely excited. When it comes to non-state actors, um, and I will first preempt this by saying I was born and raised in Canada and have lived in Libya since 2005. So my experience of governance has gone from a democratic country to a dictator regime, to a revolution, and now to what many, including myself, would call a civil war. And because of that, my perception of non-state actors has been extremely colored. 
we tend to, when we talk about non-state actors, only talk about military non-state actors. And we forget to recognize that before they were military, they were something else. They were youth, they were tribal leaders, they were rural community leaders. They had some sort of relevance, importance, and legitimacy within their community that gives them legitimacy they now have with the added benefit, of course, of arms. So the way that I've always presented it and the way that I hope we can start looking at it really is what space is made available to these groups that makes them feel so out of place in the governance of their own country that they choose violent methods. And in order to explain this, I'll give you an analogy that my mother gives me. My mother's a very smart woman. She's raised 11 kids. All of us are still alive, so. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I give her a lot of benefit. Um, my mother gives me an example of imagine you own a house, and this is your house. And your house, it might have broken windows, the lights might not turn on, but it's your house, you own it. And you sit in your house and one day someone comes into your house, the only thing you have in the world, and they rearrange the furniture. My mom is very generous, by the way, when she says rearrange the furniture. <laughs> because um, usually when someone comes in, they do a lot more. But So they rearrange the furniture, and they invite you into your own home. So that's the analogy she gives when international communities and when there are these significant changes in local governance, and the local communities are not consulted. They are not spoken to. They feel completely alienated from a process that's in their own country, from an area where they were the authority. So when you go into a local community, and my number one recommendation when it comes to human rights and non-state actors is don't give them the opportunity to become violent non-state actors. I mean, we, we tend to, at least what happened in Libya was after the revolution, we had a post-revolution transitional period that was driven by diaspora and elite, and that's not what we need. We need to recognize that yes, there are functioning systems. They're not the systems that we necessarily want. But we're not going to create new ones. So what we need to do is we need to bring those ones to a point where they can work for everyone, where they are fair to everyone. Because we don't want to go from 42 years of marginalizing one group to another 42 years of marginalizing another. I think we need to be able to find a happy medium. And unfortunately, in our part of the world, it's always been very black and white. <laughs> you either are or you aren't. And that's one of our difficulties. To speak really quickly to Women, Peace, and Security and, and Resolution 1325 in the Beijing platform, I'm really glad you mentioned youth. And I'm really glad, actually, that Princess Besma mentioned youth, um, thankfully. Because we tend to always talk about youth relevance and importance, and I never see them anywhere. So um, I feel like that's probably a step that we all need to take to ensure that more youth are involved in our own policymaking processes and that we see them on public policymaking, right? Because a lot of these conflicts are driven or our youth are either being utilized as conflict drivers or are driven by youth. Let's not deny it. But they also are easily solvable by youth. And I think that when we have decision makers and policy makers who don't necessarily think in that same capacity, much like we say we need more women in decision making spheres and in mediation spheres, we need more youth. We need to recognize that their concerns are valid. We need to recognize that there is a conversation that needs to be had with women, with youth, with minorities. And I feel like that is the best way to address non-state actors, is by making them state actors, by making them part of the conversation b before they choose alternative methods to express themselves and their concerns. So I hope that was in time. Thank you. I'm, I'm very lucky today with, with timing. Um, Ale spoke about that we usually bring to the floor the discussion about the military non-state actors. We forget that they were not military before, the importance of inclusion of all parties, but also with a special focus on youth. It's important not to alienate youth from the process. Moving beyond the policies now, we have Ms. Reda Saba. Uh, Reda uses film as a medium for communicating her messages with a body of work that stretches to over 250 documentaries and short films, she focuses on the importance of human rights in her work. Media plays an important role in gender equality. The use of media can be incredibly powerful or very harmful. Reda, as a filmmaker and women's rights advocate, 
What are your views on media's capacities to address and deliver the stories of women in the Middle East and women who have experienced conflict in particular? What are challenges and opportunities in this area? And what role and responsibility does the media have? Reda. Seven minutes. <laughs> Please. <laughs> All right. Thank you, and women. Uh, thank you, Jordan. Uh, for having me here. It's a great opportunity. Uh, well, let me start saying that the international media focuses on numbers. It focuses on stories that have already taken place and become news. Uh, for me, it's different. Uh, I focus on listening to people and, uh, and uh, focusing on women in general. I don't have successful stories or uh, uh, not successful stories. I have ordinary women who are facing their, their daily life. In Jordan, as everyone by now, they know that uh, we have refugees in camps. We have the second biggest uh, camp in the world. But I think our problem is with the refugees outside the camps. These women and children, and when I say children, I say uh, boys and girls, are facing uh, so much on a daily basis. Uh, okay, I, I hope I'm going to stick to this, but <laughs> Dr. Salma uh, early um, mentioned the early marriage, and I just wrote an op-ed uh, on Women's Day talking about a, um, a girl uh, in an early marriage, uh, a story about a girl in Zaatri, when Zaatri started, uh, uh, which is like three years ago in Jordan. Uh, and this woman, she was 12 years old, this girl, she was 12 years old, she was married, uh, after three months, she, with, with no legal uh, uh, papers, uh, after three uh, months, she was sent, sent back, as if she's an item, sent back to her family. Uh, and she didn't know that she was pregnant because she's too young to know what's happening with her. Uh, the father get lost. He didn't know what to do. He tried to call the husband, uh, no respond, of course. The husband is from, from another country. He already left Jordan. And what happened? The father had to make the registration of the baby under his name. So I'm just giving a small example. What are the challenges that women are facing now with such a big problem, such as early marriage? So anyway, so the women that they need help, when I go and visit them and see them and, and film them, I discovered that they don't know that they need help. They need someone to tell them that they need help because they don't know that this is something that's abnormal, that what's happening with them. They don't know their rights. They're not educated enough to know their rights. Um, they're always after what the, what the men going to tell them in certain areas. And, and here I have to say that I focus on uh, the, the small certain areas, especially in north, where you actually uh, have refugees with their uh, relatives because, you know, between Syria and the Jordan, there's lots of families in common. And uh, for the longest time, you know, uh, yani, like they used to have breakfast in, in, in Dara'a and then come back to Jordan, so they're very mixed together. Uh, one, another example that I would like to highlight to, to tell you how much the woman has pressure on her, and this should be also for in media we should you know focus on it you know women are not numbers it's not about that most of the women in, in a refugee women in jordan 80 percent of them are women this is not our problem the problem what, what's happening with them like one of the uh, workshops with you and women uh, that i did with the zaatri camp uh, was I remember one of the ladies told me that I work for six to seven hours a day. I take one JD per hour. Uh, so I go back home uh, with six JDs, Jordan Dinar. Uh, I, I buy cigarettes for my husband and, and my son who smoke. They both smoke and they don't work for five JD. I only have one JD or two JD if I'm lucky to get food. Okay, so so I always say that, uh, and why do you allow them to smoke? You know, they can go out and, and work. No, they can't. Of course they can't because, you know, they have to get paper and already my husband was injured. So the woman always feel in, in certain communities that, you know, she is the last to eat. 
she is the last one to take care of herself. She is the last one to sleep in the in the in the in the house. She has, she's you know like uh, women women uh, have lots of issues now in Jordan. I have lots of problems now, not because only they they they're with this crisis. In general, women we're all most of the the, the people here are women, and you know you don't go to sleep until you make sure that every everything's fine, everyone is okay, and on crisis they take care of everything else. Yeah, they, they just take care of everything else. So, well, anyway, uh, I'm not going to tell stories, but I have to say that um, I, I try through my work to empower the storytelling. I try through documentaries, and that's why I love documentaries, to empower the, the, uh, the, or to discover the, the talents of these women to tell their stories with their language, with their narrative. Uh, I have to say that people come to us to make story about us. Uh, they come to us to report, to cover our stories, our needs. But we have a shortage of our own narrative. We have more about us than we have about ourselves. Thank you very much. Many women don't uh, know that they need help. Uh, the type of problems that they endure is something that we need to uh, dig more and to know more about. There is an immense pressure on women. And your efforts were th uh, to empower m women through storytelling. Last, but certainly not least, we have uh, Ms. Leila Nafa'a to my left, the Director of Projects at Arab Women Organization. Leila has extensive experience in the region working on women's rights, in particular with Palestinian refugees. She has worked for civil society and aims to come up with innovative approaches to address serious challenges. Can you, close, can you please close the door? We have spoken of policies, role of government, and the media thus far, dear Leila. I would like to uh, n get your opinion on the role of civil society. What has the role of the Jordanian civil society been? And what role should civil society play in advancing the Beijing platform for action? How can they support the integration of a women and peace and security framework? Yeah. Please. Uh, in addition to my to extension my thanks to the UN woman for arranging this I would like also to thank the audience because you're bearing with us the heat isn't it and I, I'm thrilled that, in fact to see uh, that so many people are coming to hear about Jordan it's a I'm full so, house and, and yeah, even uh, some are, so are standing glad. so it's heartwarming I, I should start by telling you that in 1995 I was in Beijing I was over the moon with excitement for mingling with women activists from all around the world. Yes, while in Beijing, I thought then that with the spell of the Beijing Declaration and the Beijing Platform for Action, that we would bring forth the dreams of all women for equality and social justice throughout the world. 20 years ago, I was armored with knowledge, passion, enthusiasm, and hope for better and timely change. 20 years later, today, it seems like time has almost stood still. Because although the struggle never stopped, achievements were slow in coming. But some of these achievements need to be mentioned for my country. For one, is my, in my humble opinion, is the role of civil society. When the civil society was ignored and seen as an intruding body 20 years ago, today it is taken more seriously with some form of responsibility steered toward it. Another achievement is the empowerment of women. As, lit as little as it is, it remains a fact if compared with their status in the past. When I said earlier that achievement was slow in coming, we need to highlight how pitiful it is that Jordan, that Jordan's amended uh, 2011 constitution has not considered gender 
as worthy of non-discrimination or that the Jordanian women deserve an equality law. Moreover, the most recent wave of extremism has unfortunately overshadowed even these very small achievements. Patriarchy, it seems, came back with a vengeance and almost full of force with the recent wave of extremism and ra radicalism to take over the little that was achieved for gender equality. The wave of hatred against women's rights and gender equality is surging after 20 years of Beijing. So what are we, the civil society, doing about that? We are aware of the domino effect of extremism in the region, the extremists' patriarchal view of women and the repercussions of that on women's issues. We realize that governments in the region, including Jordan, are using the developments in the region, especially the rise of the so-called ISIS Daesh terrorist group, as an excuse to further push aside women's pressing needs of development, as the time, according to them, is simply not right. We also realize that now, more than ever, arms and weapons are sweeping the region in the name of security with superpowers hurrying to send more and more of their technology into our region to fight terrorism and keep their interests safe. Finally, we realize that if any time the need for the civil society was urgent, that now is the time. Now is the time because we are the bridge between governments and people. We are the trusted ones who bring the voice of reason between both sides to one another to maintain peace and security. Now is our time because the ticking bombs of frustration, desperation, and extremism usually inherently start from the home and lead to nothing short of violence in coups, revolutions, or joining like-minded people in extremism. We also know that when women issues go downhill, it is almost certain that the whole society is pulled down with them too. We, the civil society in the Arab region, raise the alarm of a forthcoming annihilation of our civilization and countries as we know them. If we, the women, are continuously marginalized to a point of exclusion, the age of darkness will cloud our region and reach the whole world, as has been quite evident recently of how small the world is. So again, what will we will do? We demand our governments to reduce its excessive military expenditure and to monitor and control the widespread availability of small arms. We demand a stop to arms race in our region. We demand a peaceful approach to conflict resolution because we all know that violence breeds more violence. We know the hysteria and madness of what, are, uh, of what we are doing and we unrealistically continue to do, pure madness. We demand the use of international conventions and resolutions, abide by them and implement them unless the world no longer thinks they are viable and that the United Nations itself no longer plays the role it was mandated to play. Our demands as civil society to governments, especially in Jordan, is no easy task, even though we believe in the urgency of women matters, now more than ever, and duly because of that, and because we want results, we, the civil society, have bridged with a semi-governmental body to create a coalition for Beijing plus 20 to try to pressure the government to do what it should have done 20 years ago. We also, as civil society and women organizations, realize the need to work with men and boys to be able to make any sufficient and lasting change for women's issues, which is why our work has started to include the other half of the society. Challenges and obstacles remain, but pursuit of justice remains as steadfast as ever. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Pursuit of justice remains. Um, many issues uh, were, were highlighted. Uh, many achievements on the Beijing uh, platform for action for the past 20 years, stronger, stronger uh, civil society, more empowerment for women. However, patriarchy is still very strong, and the extremism is overshadowing the achievements that we have gained. The arms and weapons are sweeping the region, and we need to look at and up to the civil society as a conduit. Many demands, uh, among them a peaceful approach to armed conflicts and the use of international resolutions and conventions. I'm a very happy moderator because we have more than half hour for discussion, 33 minutes. So uh, we open the floor and this will be an opportunity as well for some of the speakers to share more of the information they wanted to share. Um, okay, so we will be, we will be as democratic as possible, so we will take from uh, women and men and from both ends of the room. So we start by the gentleman over there, and then your good self, and then the lady in the middle. And then over there. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Abdurrahman Halawani. I'm, I'm representing Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and my country as well, Jordan. I'm, a, I'm also a strong believer in the role of men in supporting women empowerment and gender justice in all its intersectionalities and the important, uh, importance of transparent and honest inclusion of youth in the, di in the dialogue. Her Excellency Dina Qawar highlighted that women are the carriers of burden and Ghada highlighted some of the everyday realities women live in in Jordan. Dr. Salma talked about the power relation when it comes to child marriage. I would like to hear more from the panelists about the efforts Jordan is doing on both governmental level and civil society level to challenge the power hierarchies and the structural patriarchal masculine identities and the efforts to, int to introduce a feminist hegemonic structure, know knowing that educating women about their rights is not enough for them to demand them. Thank That's you. That's going to be probably like a thesis, no? <laughs> but uh, we, we take a few questions and then we will give the floor to um, the panelists, please. Oh, is this one? Okay. And I'm with an organization called the Red Umbrella, and we work in at-risk communities and refugees, empowering women and girls. And I've um, been focusing on women and girls, but I keep having this, um, and I keep hearing it everywhere I go, that empowering boys and youth is just as important uh, because those men become those girls' husbands. So I would like to know what um, specific efforts um, on educating boys and empowering boys through maybe peace education has Jordan engaged in? Please. Hello, my name is Shelly. I'm represent, representing a group of youth from Mexico City. And um, first of all, I applaud you all for all the work you're doing. It's really amazing. Um, and my question was uh, with uh, the person over there. Um, which are the specific actions in dealing with women's violence and forced marriage, how much can a 30-year-old man listen to the UN's concerns? And then, uh, finally, we will take some questions. Yes, please. And, uh, thank you. I am uh, Dr. Sen Majinar. I'm from Turkey and from the region, and uh, closely following what has, happen has been happening in the region. And I would like to say that Turkey is one of the huge receivers of refugees in in the world and uh, as a fact Turkey has received more than three, three years that Europe has received refugees in just in three days and you could uh, understand the immense effect of the refugees in Turkey and uh, most of these refugees live in urban areas and 75 percent of them are women and also children under the age of 18. And, uh, of course, uh, it is not very easy to absorb all these refugees. The, the issue that I would like to raise, in fact, is that we have to really make use of 1325. And when it comes to asking for relief and rehab work, we invite civil society organizations. But when it comes to global governance, we say to civil society organizations, go back to your work. And we have to find 
a kind of a balance here. And since we are going to discuss 2015 plus development agenda and the SDGs, and since we are now in CSW, which is a global governance body for women, my uh, you know, demand is to remind the governments to include women's NGOs, the constituency into the work of peace resolution, uh, uh, conflict resolution and peace decisions. Thank you. I would go on some more, but I think it's, I don't have time. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I believe we, we still have time for more questions in the second round. Um, and actually, the, the, the audience made it uh, quite easy on us because the questions were structured. Maybe we can move from the government to the non-government and we can also set, shed some light on what has been happening elsewhere and, and with the media as well. So, uh, please, Dr. Salma. Um, we'd like to think ourselves of ourselves as non-government. <laughs> but just to clarify, the Jordanian National Commission is the uh, women machinery that was established by a cabinet decision um, uh, in 1993, actually, and its uh, mandate was elaborated after Beijing 1995 in order to implement, you know, was part of its main mandate is following up on the implementation of the Beijing platform. Um, so basically our relationship is like, you know, being the, in the middle between the government and uh, the um, civil society. The civil society has the, um, the I would say, the um, pleasure of uh, being able to, um, to, you, to reach the upper level and uh, demand the highest. We try to mediate and uh, build the consensus. Um, about men and boys, it is one of the major challenges and we realize that Without the engagement of men and boys, we really cannot change anything. Uh, in the morning, the, the general discussion was about the engagement and the role of men and boys in, uh, in uh, achieving gender equality. And one of the main issues that I raised is the concept of narrative, okay? Who is leading the narrative? And if we want a better role for men and boys, it's about the reinterpretation of masculinity. But also, we have to look into, and what I mentioned the session that we were in last Friday, it was a side event, is the reinterpretation of the religious text, which is actually deciding the roles of men and women and the power relations for women and women. And I focus on the idea that it is the who decides the interpretation of the text because not necessarily the interpretation is the only possible interpretation and actually we can reach a more, um, a more equal form of interpretation of the religious text that would give women more role and men lose much of the macho, machoism that we have given them within our cultures. Uh, JNCW actually has embarked on working with mainstream youth organizations to give them, um, to actually in our last uh, um, 16 days of activism, instead of us leading the discussion and dialogue about issues related to women and gender-based violence, we actually worked with youth organizations. And we found that it is very successful and better approach because let us face it, especially in country like Jordan, when we women movement are seen as feminist and as an only woman or f system, okay? It's a woman feminism, not men and women. And as elitist, we are not seen as we are representative, representing all the culture within the government. So we thought, okay, let's approach the youth, let us give them the issues, and let them debate the issues themselves. And in our closing event, which had 700 people there, with senators and uh, parliamentarians and, and, uh, and ministers, the youth stood up, men, boys, you know, young men and women, and they demanded the changes in some of the laws. And it was an amazing success. Lots of people went out feeling that they need to do something because it came from the biggest base of the nation. You know, 50% of the nation is youth. So now we're embarking on a project that works on empowering the youth or mainstream youth organizations, not female organizations, not women NGOs, but youth organizations to actually understand and be aware of the issues and then we would support their initiatives to do local mobilization, community mobilization for change. I think this is the way to move. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before I move to uh, Leila and give her the floor, I would like to also announce that UN Women is uh, started embarking on the first uh, regional survey on masculinities. Um, what define masculinities for men and boys? And we will be working on engaging 
men and boys in the gender equality and women's empowerment in the region. The other issue is that we, we've discussed briefly, but we've also been working with uh, Musawa, the, the movement, and Al-Azhar as well, to uh, look into the interpretations of uh, fiqh and rereading the Islamic text uh, from a different eye, from a more uh, gender sensitive eye, and, and hopefully we will gain traction within the coming two years. Layla, the floor is yours. Thank you again. <coughs> Well, it, it seems that we're going to focus the debate on the inclusion of uh, men and boys because this is uh, out of the civil society and uh, confession, a confession from our side that we neglected it for long. And it is time, high time. Uh, now, uh, when it comes to the organization I work in, uh, we are including, <laughs> including men and boys into our programs uh, for helping uh, women in their uh, host uh, communities uh, who are refugees from Syria. The idea here is that the engagement is not just by numbers or it is, uh, uh, it should be an ongoing engagement because we need to change attitudes. We need to change mentalities. In the part of the world that I represent, the culture is entrenched. Uh, uh, I, I mean not hating women's rights, as I said in my speech, but the way they, they, they don't consider it as important. The, the, the urgency thing that we uh, deliver is not there. So we would like men and boys to feel the, the urgency of uh, uh, having uh, women's rights. Uh, I would like to uh, go to uh, also the question about 1325 and uh, the relationship between the SDGs. Uh, from my point of view, civil society, we need to find ways and means and innovative approaches in order to link not only Beijing and the SDGs that are coming, but also to use CEDAW because it is a binding uh, uh, treaty where, where every uh, four years the governments have to uh, deliver a report. So they are, they are under tension. They, they would like to say something they have, that they have done. And also when we speak of the Beijing uh, Declaration or the Platform of Action, we do have details. I've spoken just a little bit about arms conflict, but if you open the, the uh, document and read about it, they speak about everything. This is an achievement, that it is a reference, and we know when we go to that document, where, where are the areas that we should work in order to stop the, the armed uh, conflicts or help women in that area. We need to link it with the 1325 because it is now the thing that is governing the whole world. It is the GBV. GBV is increasing and 1325 is trying to follow up with subsequent uh, uh, Security Council resolutions. Now we, we do have uh, over eight ones. They speak even about taking the rapists to the criminal court, to the International Criminal Court. This is good achievement. And because it is the, the Security Council, it is a strong uh, uh, tool in our hands. Now, uh, uh, with this SDGs, we know that with the uh, draft, that we do have a standalone uh, uh, goal for women's rights, and we do have also uh, other uh, goals that speak specially about uh, gender-based violence, which is, I, I think, uh, goal number three, and uh, putting them together, and putting the, the 1325 and its subsequent, pu putting Beijing together, and, and this now, with this formula, we feel that we are empowered. We feel that we have more uh, people to our side. We feel that if even they don't accept this part of what we're calling, we can go from another side and tell them, look, this is binding to, to our government and we should follow it. We hope that also the SDGs that are coming in September will also have indicators and will also be binding to our uh, government, uh, not just uh, reports that are put on the shelves, but to, to have a mechanism where uh, governments are not only uh, monitored by the inside 
and the civil society is weak everywhere. <laughs> and inside our countries, it is also weak. But we need the strength of the international uh, civil society to support us in order to make them real and coherent. Thank you very much. Um, Ella? So I think there has, there's, a, there's a bit of dissolution about the reach of the international community, and I think we have to recognize that. Um, it's not about getting the 30-year-old man to listen to the UN, right? That's not, that's not the, the end game is not that he should be listening to the UN. The end game is that we create systems in that country that make it impossible for him to listen to anything else. Right? So there need to be legal structures in place within the state. And I think that when, whether it comes to child marriage or peace processes, there's such a reliance on the international community. Multilateral, multilateralism doesn't work if the state is weak. It just doesn't. The, the international system is built on a strong state system, right? So one of the problems, and we're talking now about men and boys and incorporating men and boys, and. Um, is that for whatever reason, when we talk about women's rights, we never seem to be able to work in, in parallel. We can't do multiple things at once. There is a need for all different kinds of organizations. There's a need for the organizations that will work with men and boys. There's a need for the organizations that will work with minorities. There's a need for organizations that will work with religious leaders. And there's a need for the elite organizations that can work with politicians. We need them all. It has to be more holistic than, OK, well, we've been ignoring men and boys for 40 years. Let's work with them. That's not how it's going to work. We need to be able to incorporate everybody into the same conversations if we want to get genuine responses, right? So I think we just have to be much more realistic because I hear about, you know, women don't know their rights. Women are not educated enough to know their rights. And I feel like that's a disservice to a lot of women. I feel like a lot of women who are married at 13 probably know what they want and probably recognize that what they have isn't fair, but they don't have alternatives represent, presented to them, right? So I think we need to be more empathetic of the realization that you cannot go in and talk to a young girl who's married to a 30-year-old man unless you give her alternatives and unless there's a system in place where she can maybe keep her children. Um, and you can't go and talk to a victim of abuse and say, you should leave your husband when there's still risk to her. I mean, her priorities might be different. She might not be thinking of getting women in parliament. She might be thinking of getting home safe every day. So I think we need to recognize that there is a need for different bodies. And we keep trying to make this one sole mission. And that's great. The end game is wonderful, right? The end game is getting women in peace processes. The end game is getting personal status laws. The end game is, is, is reassessing what the cultural and societal norms which influence women on a daily basis are. But we can do it in different ways. There is a place for everybody at the table, and I think we just need to genuinely stop being so limiting and say this is the only role we have. So, so I, I, I just want everybody, because the questions are, well, how do we get them to listen to the UN? The question isn't how we get them to listen to the UN. The question is how do we create states and systems which recognize everybody so that the state systems speak to those people and they feel like they have a place to go. They feel like they have a structure. They feel like they have limitations and rules and policies and laws which are representative of them and for them, right? So I, I just wanted to kind of put that out there. <laughs> Thank you, Ella, and I think it's an important realization that we need to have to, that everyone has a place under the sun, but also that the roles, the different roles that are played do not take away the financial resources from the others, because that, that is a fear that some groups have that, well, engaging with men and boys or engaging with youth or etc., may take some of the financial resources that have been dedicated to other fields. So that's an, an important realization that we need to take. Yeah. So I disagree with that for one reason, and I've heard that or I've heard that all the time. Like, oh, the resources will be taken. Personally, when we give resources or, or when our organization does that, um, it's much more appealing to me to find an organization which is holistic. I, I feel like for me, the idea that oh well, this, these can only speak to youth. If an organization is coming to me saying we're working with local university groups, we're working with local women's groups, we've created a network with local imams, we've created a network with lawyers. To me, that's a much more appealing resource structure that I would put my money into than groups that say well we can only work with the 3,000 youth in this city. So I feel like I don't know, but but a wider reach as long as it's organized just makes more sense. I don't think that's a really I don't think that would be a, a difficulty. And, and that's the counter-argument. Um, yes, may, may, may we have the, the floor to, to Reda and then maybe back to you, uh, Leila? So, Reda. Uh, 
regarding working with men, we do work. I do work with men as well and boys. Uh, beside my documentaries and beside my uh, weekly reports from all over Jordan, I do make workshops and that's why uh, I'm here today actually. Uh, I, I reached working with women's rights and UN women because uh, I had an initiative a year ago and now uh, it, it became an NGO because of this need. And we are working with everyone in the co community. We are working with all, uh, with, with, we were working with religion people to convince the men that these are uh, their rights. Uh, we are working with lawyers uh, and also to tell the women that they have rights to do this and that and she won't be killed when she go back home if she does this and that. So we are working with the society, the whole society in these small areas. But I have to say that we all talking about things that on paper and I, I totally agree with anyone who's saying that education and knowledge is our is our uh, 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 big door to 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 better tomorrow education and knowledge i think if they are educated enough these women who are 13 and married or they have the, the they have the access for it to, edu to to be educated it, it it really it will it will immediately change the whole thing Lots of Jordanian women today are suffering from being uh, a, uh, divorced because lots of Syrian women got married to Jordanian men. I'm so sorry to say that, but I'm just going to say it very quickly. Uh, uh, lots of Syrian women now um, are married as second, uh, second wife to, to, the, to Jordanian men because uh, uh, the father used to think that, of course, all men in, in some, some places, they think they own the woman uh, so they can buy and sell and whatever. So uh, men, uh, Syrian, uh, Syrian, uh, Syrian fathers, uh, they want to get rid of another mouth to to give some food to at the end of the day. So the only solution is to sell the, the, the sell the girl, and that's what's happening. And probably some of us remember the the person that the father that came after uh, a Friday prayer saying, "I have five girls, 12, 18, 20, 21, uh, 23." anyone wants to get married to them, it's there for free, as if, again, they're items. So I think if the, these women know what are their, their rights, and if there is knowledge and changing of attitude, uh, and working with all, all the, the, the community, not only, they, they won't hear us, but they will let us hear them if we give them the comfort. And that's what happens with me, I give them the comfort. I, I wish, I always say that, I wish I, I have on camera what I have behind the camera. And unfortunately, it, 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 usually what I have behind the camera is much powerful than I have in front of the camera. And that's why sometimes I have to live with these women and I have to, have to make workshop with the community for like a week or something like that so I can be able to know that, ah, Umm al is uh, suffering from uh, uh, being abused. This uh, Jordanian woman is suffering because she's divorced because she didn't want to be the second wife. So she got divorced and nobody is actually fighting for her rights to have money from her a husband to support her. And she's not educated and she doesn't know what to do. So I think I believe that education and knowledge uh, will, ch uh, will change the attitude, will change the behavior of the society. And we don't need laws. No, we don't need papers and we don't need to sign these papers with law. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think we need to change the way people think. And the implementation of existing laws. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because, you know, because I always say that, uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm quickly going to finish this, but um, why, why I concentrate in women, uh, please understand me. I concentrate in women because uh, women should raise the coming generation. The coming generation that, that actually is suffering from the crisis that we are facing now. And this generation should be capable of rebuilding their countries. If they were, they're not capable to do that, if they're not cultured, if they don't know what is culture of peace, if they're not educated, trust me, we will stay in this 
uh, let me say, a black hole forever. And we won't be able to get out of it. Thank you, Reda. Um, Leila had a point to, uh, to respond to, and then maybe we can have another question or two before we uh, leave this room. Leila. Um, it's just a continuation of what Rada has said, that education is the road, is our road, and raising awareness is the role of, of the civil society. The idea that Allah has said, that uh, women, when they are 13 and they are married, they know. They do not know. We work on the ground. And when it was the Syrian coming into Jordan, uh, you know, in, in a very, very, uh, shall I say, bad way, like taking ref being refugees for the first time, they don't know how to behave. The story I would like just to share with you is how do they approach the, in the, these years, these times, uh, the reproductive health thing. We've worked in Jordan for long years with, with education till it was a success story. It is now, up till now, a success story that in every medical center in Jordan, there are contraceptives free for women. This is very good, but it was uh, with big efforts. Now, when the, the Syrians flew into Jordan like refugees, they felt helpless. But the machine of uh, changing the culture, our culture, the changing the attitude towards contraceptives with the rising of the Islamist religious extremists made these little uh, 13 years old mothers ignorant. They did not want to approach the clinics that are available in, in Jordan. Because it is haram, the word, the word in, in, uh, in Arabic is used for, it, it is not nice to go to, to such places. This is education. They educate against what we aim for. And we have now, and I think that what we should do now, re-educate. Because in Jordan, the, the ground is very fertile for the way we address people. And it should be again and again be, uh, there should be re-education so as we will not either be subjugated or bow to the new wave that said to women haram for, for reproductive health. I, I just wanted to say this example just to indicate that our road is education and raising awareness and capacity building for our women. Thank you. I believe between what Ala said and what uh, Reda and Layla um, added lies the truth. Uh, sweeping generalizations do not apply in many cases. We have one question and like enough time for one question. So uh, <laughs> I, I think the lady here was the first to raise her arm and then maybe you can catch the speakers outside the room if you wish. <laughs> So, um, please. We stay. Yeah. It, it seems that one beneficial way where you're addressing men and women and daughters and sons is to be able to address some of these issues by establishing a healthy marriage where there's a healthy identity of the masculine and the feminine working together to build their family and to build society. So are there any ways that you know of that you would like to implement in order to strengthen that marriage with a proper masculine and feminine relationship because then, then you're, going, you're going to men, you're going to women, you're going up to grandparents in history in a healthy way, but you're going down to the next generation. So how do you implement and strengthen that? Education. <laughs> uh, yes, um, no, because uh, there are more than one level to work with. Um, definitely, we are still at a time where we need to revisit our educational system in Jordan. A lot has been done in terms of, uh, you know, um, facing and confronting stereotypes of men and women um, in society. But still we don't, I think uh, this is something that we're also advocating for, which is having a more critical assessment of the roles of men and women within society and in the family within the educational system. We still face uh, 
even till now, questions of making assumptions about the effect of women going out and working uh, and how that affects the, the, the uh, family. So we still have a lot of challenges to deal with. Um, cultural production, this is another area that we're really worried about. I think that, um, sadly, um, um, not only, um, I would take, theater is amazing actually, theater is the part that breaks the taboos, but if you watch television, the stereotyping of the relation between men and women in, in, uh, in soap operas, and uh, we have a, f a friend from Turkey, actually Turkish, Turkish series is affecting a lot, <laughs> and it's not, not really, it's not funny, it's sad. I think we have a problem now that TVs and the media is reproducing a certain form of relationship between men and women that women actually in real life do not have. We don't have it. And it is being uh, disseminated, exported, and not only in, Syria, in, Syria, in Turkish shows, but now it's the, the boom. Before it was Mexican, by the way. <laughs> and, and we have even the Syrian, before we had Syrian shows that shows the, only the li Syrian lifestyle 100 years ago, and it was romanticized. You know, all these productions, cultural productions, I don't think there is enough, enough um, investment in new forms of cultural productions. Social media. Social media is an amazing channel for change, but at the same time, it's becoming a channel for uh, pr reproducing hate, reproducing bigotry and discrimination, and also, you know, stereotyping of women. Women in Jordan now are going, are given, for example, high leadership position, and the minute this woman gets uh, given this position, appointed or elected, immediately the, uh, all the conservatives within the society start judging her by the way she's dressed and the, instead of looking into her qualifications. So really, this is not something that we alone as, uh, if I'm saying, standing here and saying I'm representing the government, Everybody has a responsibility, and what Allah has said, everybody should be on the table, everybody should be involved in order to make that change. Um, we have to evacuate the room, because there is another side event that will start shortly, but the good news is that we are offering refreshments just around yeah, the corner, and this is where you can catch our panelists. Thank you very much for being here. Bye-bye.